This stuff is whiskey. From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Oh, wait. It's the wrong show. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. It's Friday. So, we're drinking. <laughs> well, we're not drinking yet. But we do drink. And what we're going to talk about this week is alcohol. Everybody's favorite thing. Alcohol. Those of you who don't like alcohol or don't like the idea that other people do like alcohol need to go get fucked. All right? This is the place to come to be told to go get fucked. If you want to control everyone else's behavior, go get fucked. Right? Like if you come up to me and ask me where my mask is, You know what I'll say? Go get fucked. And I'll mean it sincerely. Right? But first. Come in, in, sir. sir. From From the the heaters. heaters. All right. Once again, it's pretty dry comments week. Here's some guy. Referring to the recent video that I did with with, uh, Isaac, our young friend Isaac over there, uh, about low back position. He says, show us on this doll where Ripito touched you with his huge gorilla hands. I guess that's what they do with little four-year-olds when Uncle Tommy's been over to the house and Mom and Dad suspect maybe Uncle Tommy was out of line with little Percival. Where on this doll did Uncle Tommy touch you? Not did Uncle Tommy touch you, but where on this doll did Uncle Tommy touch you? (laughs) Oh, shit. All right. Face it. You are bald, and FYI, you are fat. (laughs) No shit, I'm bald. I'm not completely bald. I mean, Nick's completely bald. Come over here, get in the shot. Uh, I'll show you what bald looks like, okay? See? (laughs) See? Now compare bald, not quite bald, okay? Fat, not quite fat, <laughs> okay? <laughs> oh, you're pretty fat, Rip. I'm fat-ish. <laughs> but you know what? I'm, I'm not near as fat as everybody thinks I am. I really am not, you know? Uh. But, you know, these, this is the bottom point zero 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 two nine percent These are the people that died in Mali of the COVID-19 virus. Just three of them. And for the third one, please don't be an idiot with the death rate. That's not what matters. He's referring to some comment about... The virus, I'm sure. FFS, that means for fuck's sake. It's been months and people still talk about death rate as the key number. Because deaths aren't important. People feeling bad about themselves is what's the most important thing. People feeling bad about themselves, feeling bad about other people. People being made to feel inadequate 
because of their inability to put a mask on and comply with the rules and just do what they're told. You know how bad I feel about that? You know how bad I feel about not wearing a mask all the time? Imagine how I feel. I feel inadequate. I feel unloved. And I feel ashamed. Just imagine that. Imagine how I feel. That's the most important thing. Not death. No. <laughs> Cup of doo-doo here. Right? And that's comments, comments. Uh, from, from uh, uh, the douchebags. All right, now. This is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a long time, and I just decided the other night, you know, one of those deals where you can't sleep, wake up 4 o'clock in the morning, mind gets busy. So I said to myself, you know, why don't we go ahead and do the ethanol show on, uh, on the podcast? And I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, might as well. I don't know how it's going to turn out. You'll see I don't have any notes here. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, how to make alcohol, where alcohol comes from, the different types of alcoholic beverages, and uh, things of this nature. And there's a whole bunch to discuss, and I probably won't get to all of it. But it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Actually, it's a lot of fun. I started brewing, started making beer back in the late 80s, probably 88. And uh, I uh, moved to my new house in 1999, and my, my water supply out there is limited. And home brewing is a very water-intensive operation. And I haven't brewed in a while because of because of the unavailability of plenty of water. You've really got to rinse things quite thoroughly, and I just don't have the facilities to do that. So I hadn't brewed in a long time. That plus the fact that uh, when I started brewing back in 88, there was literally in North Texas no decent beer available. All you could buy was the corporate beer. Coors, Bud, Miller, Michelob, that kind of shit. That's all that was available. No beer with any character at all. And since then, you know, the beer Disneyland has appeared in just virtually every liquor store on earth. And you can get decent beer, and I don't have to brew it anymore. So, uh, uh, you know, it was an important thing to, to do, though, because you learn so much about about beer and you get to apply your freshman chemistry uh laboratory skills to the to the brewing process and you get to learn all about hops you get to go through that phase where hops are real cool and then you outgrow that and hops are not cool anymore i don't know about you but i i'm not interested in you know 225 ibu which we'll explain in a minute but uh, ethanol itself, just as a basic, as a basic introduction to what we're going to talk about today, ethanol is uh, a type of alcohol. It is a it's a uh, an alcohol that is most commonly produced through the action of fermentation by yeast. The yeast in the in the genus Saccharomyces. Now. Ethanol can be produced as an industrial product from petrochemicals, but uh, nobody drinks that because it's stupid. So ethanol comes from yeast. It comes from fermentation. And a lot of industrial-sized fermentation uh, plants are in existence all over the, uh, all over the world. And... Uh, 
Some of those big plants generate huge, giant volumes of fairly high-quality alcohol. And they all are based and rely upon the action of yeast uh, and sugar. Okay. Basically, yeast is a little fungus. It's a little fungus. There are thousands and thousands of species of yeast. They're found all over the place. They're fairly ubiquitous. And the types of yeast that we use for fermentation are the friendly types of yeast. They're very closely related to the types of yeast that are involved in the making of bread. And basically what happens with yeast is, is when yeast is activated in warm water and it, it starts to reproduce, yeast, keep this in mind, this is the most important thing you'll ever learn. Yeast eats sugar and shits out alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's all there is to it. Yeast eats sugar and shits out carbon dioxide and alcohol. So, a simple little project for you to learn about fermentation. This is the simplest little project you can, you can do. And if more people knew about this, God, I don't know what college would be like anymore. But apple cider is the simplest little thing you can learn to do, right? You can actually use bread yeast to make hard cider. It's not that sensitive to the type of yeast. So what you do is this. You go to Walmart and you get yourself a gallon jug of apple juice. All right. And then while you're there at Walmart, you get yourself a little bitty jar of Fleischmann's granular dry bread yeast. Works just fine. All right. Other types of yeast, the more more brewing specific yeast are available on the internet. You, Red Star is a company that makes very good yeast products. You can get Red Star champagne yeast, red wine yeast, mead yeast is available. We'll talk about mead in a minute. What you're going to do is you're going to take your giant jug of apple cider home. And when you get home, you're going to open the jug and you're going to pour off about that much of the, of the apple juice out of the, out of the jar to make some head space for what's going to happen next. You pour that off and then you put, this gallon jug of, of apple juice at room temperature on your kitchen cabinet. And then you take about two pinches, just pinch, pinch, of the dry bread yeast. And it's little tiny granules. It kind of looks like very small malt meal. It's kind of tan colored, little bitty grains. And those things will will go down into the into the jar and move across the surface of the apple juice. And what happens is they, they kind of spread and they'll spread out and after a couple of minutes they'll a few of them will begin to fall down into the bottom of the bottom of the jar and then pretty soon all of it is off the surface. And then if you'll watch it closely, in about two hours the apple juice starts to get cloudy. And the process proceeds from there because what is happening is that the yeast is beginning to reproduce. It's beginning to eat the sugar out of the apple juice. It's beginning to grow and reproduce. And at the same time as it does that, the process by which it utilizes the sugar generates CO2 and alcohol, ethanol, as a byproduct. All right. Now, you're going to patiently wait on this to take place. What you're going to do is you're going to take the cap that closed the jar 
and listen carefully to what I'm going to say next, because this is very, very important. (laughs) You're going to set the cap down on top of the jar or the bottle, the jug of apple juice, but you're not going to tighten it down. Do not tighten the cap. Set it there. The cap's function is to shield the contents of the jug from anything falling in from the outside. But if you tighten it down, bad things will happen very shortly. Because remember, the yeast is excreting alcohol and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is going into solution in the apple juice. And once it gets to a certain point, it wants to outgas, and then pressure will begin to build between the top of the jug and the fluid level inside the thing. Remember, you made a little head space for this to take place. Now, the thing's going to foam also. It's going to foam, and the head space is to keep the foam from running out onto the cabinet, right? But what is, what is going on during this process is very, very important. The yeast, as it secretes carbon dioxide, is putting the carbon dioxide into solution into the apple juice. In other words, it's carbonating it. And this kind of carbonation uh, is, uh, is very, very interesting. When you, when you buy a 7-Up at the, at the store, You'll notice that when you open the 7-Up or the Coke or whatever, the bubbles are real big, right? They're big. They stick to the side, the inside of the jug. And this is because those types of drinks are artificially carbonated. They just apply pressured up CO2 to the liquid. And when it comes out, it comes out rather robustly. These types of bubbles that are formed during natural fermentation in apple cider, in beer, in champagne, are tiny little delicate bubbles that feel so beautiful on your tongue, all right? So you are now in the process of making alcohol and a carbonated beverage, all right? And the longer you leave the cider at room temperature now, it doesn't like to be cold. It won't work when it's cold, so you have to leave it at room temperature. longer you leave it out, the more of the sugar in the apple juice, the yeast will eat and turn it into alcohol and CO2. It is possible to make a very high gravity, and by that I mean a very high alcohol percentage beverage out of a jug of apple juice. If you leave that thing out there for about three days and then put it in the ice box, or the refrigerator, for those of you from California, you will shut down the fermentation process. It slowly cools off. The yeast goes dormant. All of the things that made the, made the mixture cloudy flocculate out and settle on the bottom, and you'll, in about two days, will have a nice, clear, fairly sweet, bubbly, Mildly alcoholic beverage, a cider in the icebox. Once again, don't screw down the lid. Don't do it. Bad things will happen. Oh, God, yeah. You, this Pressures get out of control real easily. Uh, God, we made a batch of beer one time. And we were using Grolsch bottles. You know what those things are? The flip top, real heavy glass, green glass Grolsch bottles. And this beer really got out of hand. It was, it was, I put about 20 pounds of malt in the damn thing. And it was, I don't know what the hell was going on in there. We had them in a wooden closet. And came over one day to check the thing. And one of those bottles had exploded in the closet and had put a piece of glass about that far down into the board. 
a shrapnel, a piece of shrapnel, this green glass embedded in the wood lining of that closet. And you had better believe I carefully carried those bottles over to the sink and flipped them up and vented them. But it was, so the pressure can get out of control real quick. So again, don't screw down the cap. Now, if you want a real highly alcoholic, uh, dry cider, you leave it out longer. And I've left it out for 10 days. And my, my estimate, I, I don't know how to calculate it from Rogan. That's Rogan again. Letting you know he's coming to Texas. If you want a sweet cider, you can put it in three days is plenty of time to get a little bit of alcohol and get the thing carbonated. If you want a dry cider, uh, where the yeast is eating essentially all of the sugar out of the apple juice, uh, you will have a very high gravity, a high alcoholic percentage product. Some probably gets up toward seven, eight percent. And uh, it'll be a lot less yellow. It'll kind of change in color. And uh, that kind of cider is real good. A sweet cider would be what three five percent or it might five? be three percent yeah it might be three percent it's going to be three three and a half but not any more than that but my God one of these ten day ciders holy God you can get drunk before you know you are on this stuff it's a, it's fairly high high alcohol by volume percentage it's uh and it's it, it this is so easy to do if college kids knew this. I mean, assuming they weren't the lazy little bastards we were. You know, college, oh, college kids do this. College kids just drink the worst crap. They don't care. Well, but this is free. A gallon of cider's four bucks. Bud Light's almost free. <laughs> Bud Light's more than that. You can get a gallon of Bud Light for four dollars. Can you? No. No, you're I don't, right. I don't think, I mean, this stuff's cheap. It's cheap. And if you want to get better at this, then you invest in a little envelope of red star champagne yeast you know just use better yeast and the flavor's a little cleaner it doesn't quite have the bready kind of a smell that that uh that a bread that flashman's bread yeast would produce in this right and uh and you've got a gallon of pretty high quality drinking alcohol for not a hell of a lot of money you can make three or four gallons at a time and have a hell of a party for less than twenty dollars, I mean a hell of a party for less than twenty dollars, right? But you know, but you just have to, yeah. You, you have to actually have glasses and stuff. You know, you gotta pour the shit into your glass out of the. Yeah, a little more work than just opening a can of beer. Would you mind very quickly defining flocculate? Flocculate means when things that are in suspension uh, come out of suspension and fall to the bottom of the uh, fluid in which they are suspended. And I'm sure that our fact checkers at Snopes will fix that for that me. Right. I think that's the correct <laughs> definition of flocculation. So. Uh, and you could cause flocculation to happen. That you know there are substances that will clear fluids out. But if you put this cider in the ice box, it'll clear by itself. And you have a layer on the bottom of dead yeast and little things that in beer we call trube. That's the stuff on the bottom of the fermentation tank. Yeast husks and you know crap like that. Uh, and it, you know, you, you could, if, if you get real good at this, you can pour off the vast majority of that gallon of cider into a glass and not have any, any, uh, cloudiness come off the bottom of the deal. It just takes a little, that's a hand skill and you, you'll work on that. All right. So this is just the basic fermentation experiment that you can do. It's apple juice and bread yeast and you can get fancy with fancier types of yeast now how does this apply to other alcoholic beverages all right well let's first talk about beer okay beer is 
a product that is made from the fermentation of the solution of sugar that comes off of malted grain. All right. Now, malted grain is usually, you know, 99% of the time refers to malted barley because barley lends itself better to this process than any of the other grains. All right. Malting is an interesting process, and you have to understand how this works. So this is a two or three layers of complexity above just fermenting apple juice, right? Well, you know what? Let's go back to mead because mead is, is along the same lines as apple juice. Mead is made from fermented honey. It is perhaps the oldest fermented beverage on earth. Uh, mead is associated with the Vikings, but it was made in Mesopotamia and all over all over Europe, perhaps as early as nine or ten thousand years ago. It was it's a very old, very old alcoholic beverage. I'm sure it was discovered by accident. Honey coming from bees and yeast, wild yeast getting in honey. If honey happened to get in a, in a container and got some yeast in it and ferment and uh, it was it, 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 lots and lots of people made mead it was a it was widely available it was the first alcoholic beverage uh, I, don't, I haven't heard that cider was fermented that early but I do know that there are historical records of mead being produced a very very thousands and thousands of years ago Mead is fermented honey. So to make mead, you take a, a quantity of honey, usually measured in tens of pounds, and on the stove, you will dissolve that honey in very, very warm water. And the idea on the stove is to put the honey in a big pot, gradually stir it in, heat it up so that the solution is uniform throughout the water. So you've got a honey solution, a honey water solution. Now, the times I've uh, made mead, we were always encouraged to not boil the water. And I don't know how much of this is folklore, but uh, it's it's thought that if you boil, if you bring the the honey solution up too hot, that you sterilize it, and you don't want to sterilize it because it removes some of the character from the final product. But by the same token, you have to get it hot enough to where all of the crystal structure of the of the sugar in the honey is broken down, and you've actually got a, a good thorough solution of water and honey. Then you cool it down, and you add some yeast and most of the time when you're making yeast, you're, you're encouraged to use what are called yeast nutrients. And these are some sulfites and things that the yeast beasts need to reproduce that are not available in a pure sugar product like honey. I don't know if that's still a thing or not, but that's what we learned to do. And uh, a good uh, dry mead is a wonderful wonderful beverage i've had some excellent mead before but unfortunately most of the commercial meads that you can buy are just honey sweet they're just horrible you know they're probably five percent abv and they're just they're that it's not something i'm interested in i like a nice dry mead which approaches the quality of a good wine uh, most people don't bother with mead anymore there are you know, a lot of beekeepers that make mead. Mead's kind of a little niche thing that that you don't really get exposed to in the commercial market. There are meaderies, as they are called, in Colorado. There are several places where you can buy good meat. But it's not popular like it was 2,000 years ago because there are other ways to get your alcohol down. Uh, but in, in, in terms of a step up in complexity from the simplest, cider mead is a mead represents a step up since the 
the, the honey has to be dealt with and dissolved in water and stuff. Now, beer is another step up in complexity. Beer, as I mentioned before, is made out of malted barley. Now, what is malted barley? Malting is a term that is applied to the process by which barley grains are sprouted. Okay, as it turns out, barley is a seed. That's what wheat is. Rye, these are all seeds. And a seed contains the germ, which is the little nucleus of the seed that contains the genetic machinery for the production of enzymes that can convert the stored starch in the seed to sugar. So if you put a barley seed, a barley grain in the ground, and it gets wet, the wetness of the ground will activate the little machinery of the, the seed, the cell, and then it starts to reproduce. It's, it starts to grow, actually, and it will, it will start to make enzymes that convert its stored starch, the calories that it is going to use for, re, for growth, into sugar because the cell, just like your cell, doesn't use complicated starch. It doesn't use complex starch. It uses simple sugar. So in this case, the malt is a barley grain, and while it is malting, it will grow a little shoot out of the germ end of the, of the, of the grain. Once the thing is produced, this little shoot out of the end of it, it's just a little hair-like thing that comes growing out of the seed. You all know, know what I'm talking about if you've seen seeds grow. Uh, once that process is taking place, there are now enzymes present in that grain. Now, when we malt barley, we place it in uh, what used to be called, I'm sure there are industrial processes for this now, we place barley on the floor of a building that has been heated with fires underneath the floor. We spread the grain out on the floor, and then we flood the thing with water. And we hold, this is, this is what happens in what the a facility called a maltings. And the, the, the malt sprouts on the floor in the water, in the warm water. And it's a particular temperature. And it's held there for long enough to where the, the malt is fully malted, to where the, 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 uh, the stuff that the cell is going to use for growth is fully developed. And it's beginning to, it's got the enzymes in the malt that are necessary to convert the starch to sugar. Now, you may be familiar with malt from grape nuts cereal. If you ever had grape nuts, that is what malt tastes like. It, that's a, that's a, grape nuts is a very old cereal. It's made out of malted barley. And it was, they bake it into little cakes and then they grind it up and put it in a box and you put milk on it and eat it and it's good. Real crunchy and hard. But that's the flavor of malt. And then they figured out that brewing can produce it can can be can be facilitated by the by the use of malt so you take this sprouted malt and once it's all sprouted you drain the water off of the floor all right and then you dry the malt you dry the malt and you dry it and it once again looks like a piece of grain and during the drying process the little the little sprout is knocked off of it and you've got You've got malted barley. Now, you could take malted barley and put it in your mouth and eat it, and it tastes kind of like grape nuts, right? But remember, the reason we malted the barley 
is so that we get the enzymes that can be produced by the germ of the malt seed because the enzymes convert starch to sugar. That's what the enzymes we're after do. They take the starch, the complex stored form of carbohydrate, and break down the bonds so that what comes out at the end is sugar, not starch. All right? So let's say you buy some malted barley. You buy a sack of malted barley. And then you take that sack of malted barley home and you put a bunch of that malt in some water and you heat it up to 143 degrees and you hold it at that temperature for a period of time. What happens then is that the enzymes activate, convert the starch in the malted barley into sugar. The sugar comes out of the grain and soaks into the water that it's being held in. And now you have a, a substance called mash. And the, the vessel this takes place in is called a mash tun. And when you are mashing the, the malted barley, what you're doing is obtaining a sugar solution from the starch that's in the malt. This is called mashing. So if you ever hear the term mash, that's what this means. Now, after a period of time, and this is above my pay grade. I've never done brewing from grain. I just use malt extract, the cheap freshman in high school way to do this. But actual brewers will actually go through the process of malting the grain or, or, or mashing the grain and, and making beer out of mash. And after a period of time, you hold the, the mash at a certain temperature, then you drain this, the water off, and now this is called sweet liquor. And then the process can start because now you have a sugar solution that you have derived from malted barley and the character of the sugar solution is obviously going to be different than the character of apple juice isn't it because all of the other stuff that was soluble in the grain is also in the sweet liquor and then you put yeast in that and hops and you ferment it and you deal with it in ways that brewers know how to do and beer comes out on the other side Okay, and that's how you make beer. You make beer through the fermentation of the products of malted barley. Okay. Now, this is, uh, uh, it, it could be a very, very complicated process, and it's real easy to screw this up, too. Uh, all of your equipment has to be clean because the best way to waste a whole bunch of money in a situation like this is to get all of this infected with some kind of bacterial uh, contamination. You don't want that. All of your equipment has to be clean. Everything has to be in good condition. You've got to use good sterile laboratory technique. It's not quite as, as, uh, as complicated as cancer research, but it does involve some kind of laboratory expertise and you have to be careful with what you're doing uh, and then at various points depending on the type of beer you're going to make you're going to add various types of hops and uh, you know we're not going to go into the specifics of home brewing here but those of you that are interested in doing this can certainly figure out a way to to look this all up. See, back in the 80s when I was doing this, there wasn't an internet. We just had to look at little cheap books and stuff and fuck things up three or four times and figure out what we did wrong the hard way and and do it again and try to do better next time. But I, I made several very, very good batches of beer a long time ago, and it's just not that complicated. Now, 
The way I did it, as I mentioned earlier, was through malt extract. There are companies that will take malt, barley, and go through the malting process for you, take the sweet liquor, and then boil it down into a thick syrup. And this is called malt extract. And they will sell you this this thick malt extract, and then you can reconstitute what would be the same thing as the sweet liquor before it was boiled down into the malt extract. And it's just an easier thing to do because it you don't have to have a mash tun, you don't have to do all this other all these other processes. You just put it on the stove, add your uh, on big pan of water on the stove, add however much malt extract you're gonna you're gonna use for that batch of beer. And you can make very, very good beer out of malt extract. That's how pretty much everybody starts because of the complexity and all the expensive equipment it takes to actually handle grain. So brewing from malt extract is kind of the intro into into home brewing and and uh, brewing from grain is a step up in complexity. Now, so far we've been dealing with with spirits, with alcoholic beverages that don't require any distillation. We'll talk about distillation in just a minute, but there's one more one more thing that needs to be discussed, and that is wine. Wine is fermented grape juice. Okay, now wine is much more complicated a process than it sounds like, all right? Yes, it's true that you could go to the grocery store and get some Welch's grape juice and bring it home and put some yeast in it and ferment it and try to drink it. That's a bad idea, okay? It's been my experience, and it's probably been your experience if you've got an uncle that thinks he knows how to make wine, and he's given you a bottle of this wine that he's all proud of, and you open it, and you you pour it in your glass, and you take a drink of it, and you go... Tommy, that's real good. That's Uncle Tommy. That's Uncle Tommy. <laughs> he got into wine. And that, you know, because wine is best left to professionals, okay? Look, just buy wine, okay? Just buy wine. And here's why, all right? Wine is fermented with the yeast that comes out of the vineyard on the skins and and the stems of the grapes. Wild yeast from the vineyard is what ferments wine. Wine is very much a product of the vineyard, not the laboratory, not your kitchen. All right. Wine is produced in the winemaking areas of the world. It's an extremely delicate product. It depends on lots and lots and lots and lots of variables. And, uh, you know, the weather, how much sugar was in the grapes, when the grapes matured, if they're late, if they're early, uh, how much rain there was, what kind of soil they're growing in. All these things are, 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 are critical for, for uh, production of wine. And you buying some grape juice, even if you buy Cabernet Sauvignon grape juice from some dumbass in California that wants to sell you five gallons of this stuff, you're not going to make wine. I'm telling you, you're going to make fermented Cabernet Sauvignon grape juice. It'll be undrinkable shit, all right? It's just, how many have had homemade wine, right? Rusty's had it. Yes. Carmen's had it. It's undrinkable shit. You have to try to be gracious, you know? Oh, you did? You were honest with him? I was gracious. You know, it depends on who's giving it to you. Oh, my God. But it's just, you know, homemade wine is just, it's like a homemade car. Okay? You know, this is just, some things, 
other people do better than you, and wine is one of those things. All right, now, now, this stuff is whiskey. All right. Oh, whiskey's good. Now, what is whiskey? Well, whiskey is a product of the process called distillation. All right, distillation is a process by which a solution consisting of different components can be separated from the components of which can be separated from each other by heating. For example, in a beer, you have water and you have alcohol. And water and alcohol can be separated from beer because water and alcohol have different boiling points. The boiling point of ethanol is much lower than the boiling point of water. Let's say you take a batch of beer that doesn't have any hops in it. We'll call that the wort. W-O-R-T, that's the wort from which beer will be produced once you put the hops in it. And let's say you decide to that you'd like to get the alcohol out of that out of that wort and leave the water and you boil it and you've got what's called a piece of equipment called a still well the still gathers the 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 vapor as it comes off of the heated liquid and i'm just pulling these numbers out of my ass water boils at 212 degrees fahrenheit at sea level and alcohol, that's not out of my ass. That's the actual that's the actual boiling point of water. But the boiling point of ethanol would be, let's say it's 175. Three. 173. Excellent. That was close. What? So what happens then is that when the 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 wort gets up to 173, the ethanol begins to boil off of this combination of water and ethanol. And then the still collects that vapor and condenses it, and it runs down into another container. And if you boil that wort until the most of the alcohol is, is boiled off of this, then you have distilled the alcohol from that solution. Now, some of the things that were in with the alcohol also get carried up into the vapor so that the alcohol contains a lot of characteristics of the original liquid that it was distilled from. Okay. This is the basic process by which whiskey is produced. So if you take a, a malted barley solution and you ferment it, and you get as much alcohol in that as you can with your yeast process. And then you boil that and distill it off. Then you are obtaining the alcohol out of this malted barley solution. And there might be malted barley in it. There might be wheat in it. There might be corn in it. Because remember, the enzymes from the malted barley convert starch to sugar. And the malted barley enzymes will convert starch from corn or wheat into sugar as well. So this kind of a this kind of a mash is used to generate the alcohol that later becomes whiskey. So we distill off the alcohol and then we might take the alcohol solution and, and boil it again and do two or three distillations to purify it. And then we have a product that is called white dog, which is unaged whiskey. White dog is a term that is refers to bourbon, and bourbon is a type of whiskey that uh, is uh, 
specified by the by what is called the mash bill, how much of each type of grain is in this. Bourbon contains more than 50% corn and can contain either wheat, barley, or rye as the, as the other grains in the mash. There's going to be some barley in there because the barley is used for the fermentation process. So it's all got a little bit of barley in it, but depending on the other grains, you've got different types of whiskeys. Uh, unaged bourbon is called white dog. And it's, there's a pretty good white dog available. I think Buffalo trace makes, they bottle a little 375 of white dog. That's pretty good. I've had excellent white dog, but it's unaged. Now, if you take this product and put it in an oak barrel that has been handled in whatever way they're going to handle it, charred oak barrel, generally make the barrel put a flame in there and caramelize some of the sugar in the oak and then you stick the whiskey in there for 12 years then the whiskey that's in the oak barrel will take on the characteristics of the oak in which it has been stored for all this length of time age is whiskey's friend and the longer it's in there the smoother it gets I'm not exactly sure the chemistry of the of, of the smoothing process. All right, uh, that's also over my pay grade. But when you buy whiskey, you expect to pay more for the age, and because age is the friend. All right, it, the longer it's in the barrel, the higher the quality the product is going to be. That's why 25 year old McAllen Scotch whiskey is a thousand dollars a bottle and i know that sounds stupid but if you're really into scotch i did 25 yeah. now, i've heard of 50 year old mcallen which is five figures what was he drinking in, uh, in the Bond movie? that was 50 year old mcallen <laughs> That he, that he drank out of a shot glass. Right, right. That's how you know that was actually tea, right? So whiskey is the product of distillation. All right, now there are several different types of whiskey. I mentioned bourbon. What is scotch whiskey? Scotch whiskey is, a, is, is a, an interesting product that probably predates the American product called bourbon. Scotch whiskey is... Theoretically, 100% barley malt. There's no other grain in Scotch whiskey. Now, there is a product for sale called blended whiskey, which is basically at least 40% Scotch, and the remainder remainder of it is vodka, basically. And they, the Scottish government allows that to be sold as blended whiskey. And, you know, Chevis and Cuddy Sark and black and white and doers and all that shit is that's all uh blended whiskey i don't need to be drunk that bad so i don't drink it uh single malt scotch whiskey is the product of one distillery and the, the scotch whiskey goes through a different process than uh than other types of whiskey when let's go back to the malting process when you have a maltings and you've got the little wet seeds of malted barley laying on the floor and we drain the water off and now we've got this wet malted barley if we're going to make scotch out of it what we're going to do is we're going to dry that malt over a fire made of peat and peat is the is the stuff that grows in Scotland and it also grows in Japan interestingly enough it is a an accumulation of the sphagnum plant that goes it lays on the ground and it accumulates in peat bugs and this stuff is dried it's cut out of the peat bugs and dried and used for fuel but it is in this particular case you set a peat fire underneath the malt and the heat and the smoke 
from the peat fire dry the malt and therefore flavor the malt. And then the same process is used with malted barley that we previously described. It's mashed and then the sweet liquor is fermented and distilled and all of the smoke and all of the peat character, especially if the water you're using uh, is peaty water, which a lot of water in Scotland is. These are uh, the things that add to the character of Scotch whiskey that's not found anywhere else. Now, I will say that the, the Japanese are making a very damn good copy of Scotch whiskey these days. Japanese malt whiskey is what it would be called, and it's there that industry's come up quite a bit. Very high quality products over there. Yamazaki and uh, Hakushu. There are several different types of of very good malt whiskey that are that are coming out of Scotland. That are uh, essentially the Japanese are very very good at copying things, and this is one job they've done very well. In contrast. The Indians don't seem to understand this process. There's a some some Indian whiskey called Amrut. Don't buy it. And you know who else fucks this up? The Canadians. <laughs> the Canadians do not make beverage alcohol. I'm sorry, there aren't any whiskey people that will agree that there's any beverage Somebody, alcohol being produced in Canada. Somebody's typing the word whistle pig right now. <laughs> whistle pig is yeah. not Canadian. It's not Canadian? I no. It's Canadian. No, it's a rye whiskey. It's an overpriced rye whiskey in the United States. Uh, but the, the, the Canadian, all the little girls at 10 Bar in Canada think that Canadian whiskey is, is rye whiskey, and it's not. It's the rye whiskey version of, there's some rye whiskey in it, but the laws in Canada allow them to, well, there aren't any laws in Canada. It's, a, it's, a, it's the Wild West in terms of a distilled beverages in, in Canada. And I, I'm sorry. Look, this isn't my fault. You guys want to be taken seriously? Start acting seriously, but you're not making a fucking drinking product up there. Hell, I don't even like Molson's. I think their beer is shitty myself. You know of a decent Canadian beer? Labatt's, is that any good? I've never had it. I've had it. I wasn't even, it's like Coors. You know, all of it tastes about the same. But, uh, oh, my God, somebody comes, Crown Royal. Oh, that's, that's all I drink is Crown Royal. Only the best for me. <laughs> what are you, 14? Oh, God. Anyway. So, distillation. Distillation produces whiskey. We get all these these high-alcoholic level products. Al- ABV, alcohol by volume, is the, is the measurement by which all of this stuff is reckoned. Now, 40% is 80 proof. Proof is basically twice percent. And it's an old measurement that used to be uh, used. I think it has actually something to do with whether the liquid will will light on fire by itself. I'm not exactly sure about that. You ought to look that up. That would be a good thing for you to do is look that up, what proof actually means. But proof right now is that number is twice the ABV. So if you've got an 80 proof whiskey, that is a 40% ABV. All right. Now, distillation can be applied to other things than just beer. Essentially, whiskey is distilled beer. All right. Brandy is distilled wine. So if you take wine and put it through the distillation process, and you you run it through the still three or four times, you will get brandy out of that. And so brandy is is a high-gravity 
as we say. And gravity, I keep using that term. Maybe I ought to explain it. If you, when you make beer, all right, and you uh, look at the specific gravity of the of the wort, the higher the specific gravity, the more sugar is in the wort, and the higher the ABV and the resulting product will be. So a lot of people tend to say high gravity, and they mean by by that they mean high ABV. And it's just a, a term we use. So when I say high gravity, that's what I mean. I got information on proof. If you yeah, proof. The history of the proof system is about gunpowder. That's what it was, yeah. In the old wooden ships of the 18th century to find um, how strong an alcohol was, they mixed it with a little bit of gunpowder. And... Um, in other the words, the goes, more the more alcohol in it, the lower the water. Yeah, soldiers right. in the British Navy would apply rum to their gunpowder to test its strength. If the weapon still fired, they had proof that the rum was strong enough. Also proof that it would burn the ship down if lit. <laughs> Which it did occasionally do. So if it was 50% or more, it was flammable, uh, and it fired. So that was 100 proof. Right, 100 proof. Yep. 100 proof rum, 50% ABV. Right. Now, if you see a product called bottled in bond whiskey in the United States, you're looking at a hundred proof whiskey. And the bottled in bond law came about, oh, probably more than a hundred years ago uh, for the same reason. The people were selling, you know, 25% ABV and calling it whiskey and stuff. And it, it just is not the same quality product. So uh, the federal government got involved in it, and uh, if a product is is marked bottled in bond, then that is the same thing as 100 proof or 50% ABV. And uh, a whole lot of cheap whiskey is, is sold at 80 proof whole lot of horrible cheap whiskey you're getting a little bit better quality product if you can if you can buy it at a higher abv and then what you do when it's a higher abv here's the funny thing about funny thing about whiskey your mouth likes whiskey at really at about 80 proof about 40 percent is what your mouth likes to taste now Real high quality whiskey is often sold at 66. I've seen 69.5% ABV, which would be 139 proof. You have to understand that this is not a test of manhood. Okay? You're not supposed to drink whiskey at 66% ABV. That's not what your mouth wants to do. You can't taste anything if you do that because your mouth is a water-based system. Your your nose is a water-based system. And if you put something in it that is 66% ABV, it the the mucosa don't react well. But here's a more important piece of chemistry that's involved in this thing. If you've got a whiskey at 66% ABV, a lot of the stuff in that whiskey is dissolved in the alcohol fraction of the whiskey. And at 66%, that means that only 34% is water. But remember, your mouth and your nose like water things. They're aqueous-based systems. So if you take a bottle of, or you take a dram of whiskey at 66%, what you should do and what you'll learn to do before you waste any more money is to water that down a little at a time down to where you want it to be. And you want it somewhere in the vicinity of 40%, 43% maybe, but but certainly not 50 You know, the fact that you can drink it doesn't mean that it tastes better there. All right? 
And there's a there's a there's a thing you can do. You'll take a real real high quality bourbon that say it's bottled at sixty six percent. I've got a bottle of Thomas H Handy Sazerac at the house that I think, if I remember correctly, that shit's sixty seven percent, sixty seven point three or whatever it was ABV. Well, what you've basically got there, if you'll think about it, is you have a bottle and a half of whiskey. You know, you take an ounce of that, put an ounce dram in your glass, and then you add water up to about an ounce and a half, and now you've got it down to about 40%. And what you do is this. It's an interesting experiment. You'll take the water a little bit at a time, put it in the cup, and the cup should be shaped like that, not like this like a, a snifter let me have that real quick because this is important glassware for this kind of thing is very important all right if you'll look at this 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 cup is shaped to contain the vapor column over the top of the liquid and when you drink what you're going to do is stick your nose down into that and smell it as you drink it that's how it's done that's how it's done now, if you have a glass like this, this one won't work. This glass, and you've got high gravity, high ABV whiskey in this thing, and you add a little water to it, a little water at a time. Add some water, smell it. Add some more water, smell it. And what you will find is a process that we refer to as opening up. The, the, the flavor and the, the nose opens up as you get more water in there and more of the things that are contained in the alcohol fraction come out of solution and go into the water. That's where they're accessible to your mouth and your nose. All right. This is a, you, you need to experiment with this because if you're buying extremely expensive whiskey and trying to drink it neat, you're wasting your money. All right. It's, that's a stupid thing to do this once again this is not a manhood test this shit is expensive and there's not any point in wasting it all right real real good expensive whiskey at high abv needs some water it's supposed to have some water you're supposed to water it do it carefully don't overshoot it okay now i started to talk about brandy brandy is distilled wine whiskey is distilled beer brandy is distilled wine all right. Cognac is distilled champagne. Armagnac is a distilled, it's a brandy from the from a specific region in France. Champagne region is a specific region in France. These are all distilled spirits. All right. Vodka is distilled pretty much anything you can get to ferment. You can make vodka out of Wheat, you can make it out of rice. Potatoes have been used to make vodka. Polish vodkas, proudly made out of potatoes for some fucked up reason. I don't really understand. But and good vodka doesn't really have much flavor. It's got kind of a sweet ethanol kind of a kind of a flavor. Uh, a lot of people are making vodka these days because it doesn't require any age. There's no such thing as aged vodka. It's just ethanol. It's typically produced at, at 80 proof. Uh, there's, there's several Texas distilleries making pretty good vodka. Tito's is pretty good vodka. Now, there's there's some expensive vodka. Have you ever had Shevkov? That's real good. That's real good vodka. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I think that's a Ukrainian product, I believe. Uh, Stolich, Naya, I don't like that. Stolich, I don't think Stolich's any good myself. Shevkov is a much better product than that. Tito's is better than either one of them, though. Tito's makes a damn good product. Do you know what that's made of? No, I don't. Don't have any idea. See if you can look that up. It'd be interesting to know that. Where Where are those guys? Are they in Austin? San Antonio. San Antonio. Uh, Austin. Austin. It's a that's a that's a damn good vodka, it really is. And uh, I just bought the first bottle I've ever bought, like 
last month. And uh, I was really impressed with the, the, the flavor of the stuff. Now, the flavor of vodka is an interesting. It really is an interesting concept. It actually does not have flavor in the sense that whiskey has flavor. It's a good vodka is good because it doesn't have any bad flavor. <laughs> that's, that's the best way to think of it. A good, clean vodka. Tito's is uh, corn. Corn vodka. Interesting. So, you know, you can make vodka out of shoes, probably, if you've got enough of them. You know, it's just whatever you got laying around. Spaghetti vodka. I wonder if they make, the Italians make spaghetti vodka. I got to start. Now, gin. What is gin? Gin is flavored vodka, basically. Gin is grain alcohol infused with all kinds of things. Now, London Dry Gin is primarily uh, flavored with juniper berries, and that's about it. But the Scottish people make botanical gins like Hendrix and, and the Botanist. Botanist is an Eiley gin. Uh, and I believe the botanist is made by Lagavulin, that distillery on Eiley. I believe it is. Uh, botanist is widely available. That's the best gin you can buy all over the place. Hendrix and, and botanist are excellent products. But a lot of people, a lot of small distilleries around the country are making craft gin now. And the reason they're doing that is because it doesn't require age. Age is expensive. Age is expensive. If you've got the resources and you're a big company like Buffalo Trace and you've got the resources to make whiskey and keep it in the cask for 10 years like Eagle Rare and not make any money off of that investment for 10 years, then you're pretty well healed, aren't you? You've got uh, enough money to sit on that investment. And let the and let the thing grow, but smaller, smaller producers, smaller distillers don't have the luxury of being able to defer a return on their investment for ten years. So, you know, there's there's a lot of smaller distillers around the country right now that are selling what is really shitty whiskey. You know, for too much money because they, I understand they've got to try to get their money back out of the thing. But this is one of the reasons that big companies make generally better whiskey than small companies. It's like, like back to the example of a car. I, I would not buy a car that Bobby had made for me. As good a mechanic as he is, he doesn't have the resources to make a car. So I'll buy a car from a big company and let him work on it. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy pay fifty dollars for a bottle of whiskey from a small producer that I don't know anything about. I've done that enough times and wasted enough money on it to know that it doesn't work very well. And it's not what you want to do. Okay. Age is in in terms of uh, whiskey, age is quality, and age is money. Time is money. So keep all these things in mind. Uh, let's see, gin. What else do we need to talk about? Uh, this is, is uh, distilled. I don't even know how to say this. Uh, Bruch Lighty. Okay. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's one of the other Isley distillers, yeah. Bruch Lighty. Uh, which is an excellent single malt scotch. They've got lots and lots of different expressions. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, there, Bruce Lighty sold about two different expressions of their whiskey. When I say the term expression, if Lagavulin makes the standard 16-year-old, another expression would be the 10-year-old. They sell an 8-year-old. They sell a no-age statement. They didn't used to do that. There was only one lag of Ulan that you could get. So the market for all these distilled spirits has just exploded over the past 10 years. Uh, whiskey is, has become a serious problem, especially American whiskey. High quality bourbon has become hideously expensive and largely unavailable. Really, really good stuff like Willet 
that you could used to buy for $40 off the shelf is there's a waiting list for it at $300 now. It's just unfortunate. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how you, and, and, and you can't really fix that problem. You can't really fix the problem. You can't make age happen faster. You know, the use of small barrels, micro barrels, you know, like 10 gallon barrels instead of 550 gallon barrels solves some of the problem, but, but there's no substitute for letting the shit sit there in the rick house and get good over the years. That's why 25 year old McAllen is so goddamn much money. Uh, there's, I've had 25, six, seven year old scotch in my mouth three or four times. And it is, it's just an indescribable difference that that much time in the wood makes to the stuff. It's just 25 you know. year old McAllen right now at, uh, Denton total wine is $2,300. 25. 25 year old 25 year old you know kirkham had one of his customers give him one of those he still got it i think i think that was bought back when it was 800 dollars. 25 year old mcallen is what'd you say 2500 2300 2300 someone well buying see that's that. just not something you one of your listeners is buying that right now just so they can you see think it. someone just so they can you say think they we got, got that those kind of people listen to me. I have a hard time believing that. But, uh, oh, I would imagine there's a 35-year-old McAllen laying around someplace. You know. Oh, and listen, don't don't you people leave here with the impression that age happens in the glass. When you, when you have a 25-year-old McAllen, it was in the barrel for 25 years. Once it's bottled, it stops changing, okay? Uh, a real old, old bottle of four-year-old whiskey is still a bottle of four-year-old whiskey. It, it doesn't improve in the glass. Nothing chemically happens to it in the glass. Glass is dead. Wood is alive. Uh, so have we come on over pretty much everything? Hey, you could get a 30-year McAllen in uh, Denton for $3,600. $3,600. 30-year-old McAllen. What kind of an income would a guy have to have? Your income. To where <laughs> mine? You're a wealthy, white, old, white guy, aren't you? Well, I'm an old, white guy. I don't know that I'm wealthy, but I'm certainly not going to spend $3,600. Look, I'm not worth $3,600. <laughs> Why would anyone waste that on me? You know, it's, someone's going to ship you one. Watch. No, won't happen. Won't happen, man. Nobody that listens to me Rogan's is that stupid. Gonna sh- right? Rogan's going to ship you one. <laughs> That's how he's going to get you on the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd go for that. Yeah. I'd go on there for that. He could afford it. Yeah, Rogan will send he, you one. He's got a lot of money. He does. You know, he if anybody could buy a thirty six. A 35-year-old bottle of McAllen, it would be him, right? Yep. Uh, well, you know, I don't know. I have to think about it. I'd, even then, I'd have to think about it. So, uh, are we leaving anything out? Sake. Sake is made out of rice. Sake is made out of rice. Rice is a grain. Therefore, sake really is a beer, isn't it? It's a beer. I don't have any sake because it tastes like rinsed underwear to me. <laughs> What's the, what uh, the Koreans I, drink? Go, soju. 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 What's that? Is I don't, rice? you know, I don't remember uh, what the hell that is made out of. It may be rice too, but soju's good. I kind of like soju. Rice or sweet potatoes? It's, uh, we had real good soju in Seoul when we were over there in 2014. It's good. That's excellent stuff. Those crazy bastards will start putting whiskey in their soju, you know, and they start off with a glass of soju and then they... <laughs> These guys can drink now. 
they can drink yeah. and make really good fried chicken. Oh, best fried chicken I've ever had yeah. in Seoul. Oh, it's excellent. Weird. I don't know where they picked that up, but, man, they do fried chicken. like whew, It's good. Best fried chicken I've ever had. Excellent stuff. Can't say enough about Koreans and their fried chicken. <laughs> but I don't know. So weird. For, it, 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 it seems as though it, 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 it seems as though the Europeans and the Americans make distilled spirits better than anybody else. And uh, as as good a job as the Japs are doing with this, can I say Japs now? I think so. I can say I Japs. Can, they don't it. care. <laughs> they don't, they knew who I'm talking. I didn't call them nips. <laughs> Uh, it's your call completely. <laughs> no, that's not pander to them. The Japanese are, they've got an excellent distilling industry, and I've bragged on them. I'm telling you, that stuff is excellent. And uh, God, I, I first bought, I bought my first bottle of 12 year old Yamazaki for $40 about 10 years ago. And they've got that stuff bidded up to like $95 right now. They sell an 18-year-old Yamazaki that I think, and, and this is the only time I've ever seen this, the 12's better. The the two times I've had that side by side, I thought that the 12 was better. I don't know how it's possible, but that's what goes on anyway. But the Yamazaki's excellent. If you can find a bottle of Yamazaki 12 and you can stand it, buy it. Because it's, it's as good as anything for that same amount of money coming out of Scotland. It really is. Uh, I don't think we've left anything out. Aquavit is the Scandinavian caraway schnapps. And schnapps is vodka with flavors. Not peppermint schnapps is vodka with peppermint in it. You didn't talk about rum at all. Rum, I didn't talk about rum. Because I don't drink the shit. But... Rum, now rum is actually a very important product in terms of the history of the world. Rum is made from molasses. It is, it is distilled fermented molasses juice, sugarcane juice, basically, is what it is. You can make it out of molasses. I think probably the big rum distillers just take sugarcane juice, ferment it, distill that, and call that rum. That's probably what Bacardi White is. Uh, rum made from molasses is a different type of rum. And uh, rum has played an important part in, in the history of the world, and people don't understand why this is. Rum is, uh, rum is important to the British Navy. And uh, somebody will correct me on this, uh, but Sailors uh, were allotted a rum uh, ration every day up until relatively recently. Now, if you are on a sailing ship in the age of sail, all of your water is stored on the ship, on the deck of the ship, in giant barrels called water butts. That water was obtained from uh, islands or, or, you know, rivers coming off of islands or, you know, rivers coming off the, the shorelines that they were, they were nearby. They would go in in boats, fill up the water butts, and uh, all of their water was, was, you know, meteoric water running across the ground. Well, that's filthy, right? You know, you, you know, river water, you'll fill up your, you've got to get water somewhere. If you've happened to be able to catch rainwater, you shape your sails into rainwater collectors, and it would that would work just fine. But if if you were 
you had to have every time you got an opportunity you filled up the water butts on the ship so what sterilized the water rum sterilized the water that's what the rum was for all right every time a sailor drank water all day long he was drinking a solution of water and rum because without that everybody was sick the alcohol killed everything in the water which means that everybody was a little bit drunk all the goddamn time now if you take rum and water and put some lime juice in it you have a substance called grog grog you put a little sugar in with the in with the water rum and lime you've got a a grog and grog is good it's an excellent drink i've had it in fancy bars order a navy grog sometime they'll make that with a with a good brown rum and some hell i ordered that up in new york one time uh, a girl made that out of uh, Pusser's Navy Rum, which you can buy. It's a brown rum. It's good. Uh, and lime juice and some fresh squeezed grapefruit juice. And it was good. Oh, God, that's an excellent drink. Uh, six Water Grog was, reviewed, was regarded as a punishment. It's weak grog. I think the, the standard would have been four water grog. In other words, four parts water, one part rum. But uh, this is how the British Navy, for 200 years, navigated the planet. In 1970 all, is when they stopped doing it. 19, they had rum as a daily ration up till 1970. Isn't that interesting? But it was, it's a, rum is an important. People don't understand that what's amazing to me you read the the patrick o'brien novels and there is an entire very complex technology that we don't that we've lost we've forgotten all of it every bit of it's been forgotten how do you know in the south pacific where in the hell you are all of that navigation how do you sail almost straight into the wind had to do it. If you had a north wind, how do you go north? They knew how. It was you have to do it, you know. You do it like that, but but that's how, but how do you do that? How do you know when to do what? It's just it, it's a terribly amazing thing that we've just forgotten all about. But rum was a big part of that. It rum was a big trade item. All the the West Indies produced all that rum and all of that, all of that trade. You know, the slave trade was intimately involved in all of this, and all of this world history is tied up in this one type of alcoholic beverage. It's amazing. Uh, what else we leave out? I'm glad we didn't leave out rum. That's a very interesting stuff. Try some grog. Make yourself some grog. Pusser's Navy Rum, still available. Oh, it's good. Pusser's Navy Rum, a little something a little sweet in it and some lime juice and water and, you know, ice. British guys didn't have ice, of course, but we've got the luxury of ice. So, yeah, well, you know, we'll probably think of something when we close up here. Uh, and... Uh, you know, comments from the haters. Rip didn't know anything about alcohol. Stick with what you know. <laughs> Aren't those wonderful? Okay, well, let's just let's wrap it up. I exercised remarkable constraint. Later, Gator.